Can you imagine what life was like here in America 150 years ago? There is a fascination among many people with that era, which seems to be so recent. It is a time in our history that shaped so much of who we are today as a country. There have been changes since the 1800s, but remnants of those years are still with us today. Since photography existed then, there are photos in which we can see the buildings, the homes of the people, the style of clothing, the roads and the bridges that were made for wagons and horses, the chief modes of transportation, which were so different from travel today. What is it we find so significant about events that occurred 150 years ago? Well, stay tuned and we will show you. The School Sisters of Notre Dame came to St. Louis 150 years ago, and today's program is about the woman they affectionately call Mother Caroline Fries. She is the one responsible for bringing this group of women educators to St. Louis in 1858. Their legacy is still with us today. The presentation we share with you today was created for the centenary celebration in 1992 of Mother Caroline's death, which occurred in 1892. We share this revised presentation to introduce this remarkable woman who is truly a woman for our times. Among the European immigrants who came to the United States in the 1840s was a remarkable young woman of 23 named Sister Caroline Fries. She was destined to become one of the pioneers of the parochial school system in America, a leader whom a prominent American bishop would later call one of the greatest and best women of our country. After a rough voyage from Bremen, Germany, Sister Caroline and five other sisters sailed into the New York Harbor, led by the foundress of their young religious order, Mother Teresa of Jesus Gerhardinger. Sister Caroline described the scene. Under waving flags and a gun salute, our ship entered the port of New York. Several hundred steamships, the spread sails on the other ships, the brisk, active movements of the sailors on duty in the harbor, the simple red brick houses occupied by some of the more than 500,000 living in the seaport of New York. New York was only the first stop on their long missionary journey. They planned to go on to a settlement of German Catholic immigrants in the wilderness of western Pennsylvania known as St. Mary's, where the Redemptorist Fathers had a mission. Only 14 years earlier, in 1833, Mother Teresa had started a new religious community to meet the educational needs of poor and middle-class German girls. Young Josepha Fries joined her in 1840, eventually receiving the name Sister Caroline. Brilliant, enthusiastic, generous, Caroline volunteered for the American mission. She knew it would be difficult, but she never dreamed that before the sisters reached St. Mary's, one of them the novice Emanuela would die. As they coped with that loss and the bleak reality of life in the colony at St. Mary's, they realized that the discouraging stories they had heard in New York were true. This primitive settlement needed their help, but it was no place to set up a mother house. Nevertheless, they did their best, welcoming and teaching children often too frail to learn. Within weeks, Mother Teresa had a solution. Thanks to the head of the Redemptorists, Father John Neumann, 
three of the sisters, including Sister Caroline, would go on to Baltimore, where teachers were also needed. Keenly aware of the new culture in which she lived, Caroline polished her English with the help of Father Neumann. During that first year, he invited Mother Teresa to join him on a visit to several redemptorist parishes, where he hoped the Notre Dame sisters would open schools. She took Sister Caroline with her. In just five weeks, they had covered 2,597 miles, traveling by train, stagecoach, and steamboat, stopping at Pittsburgh, Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Buffalo, New York City, and Philadelphia, before returning to Baltimore. The sights and sounds of this new world fascinated Caroline. In her account of the journey, she comments on, The smokestacks in sooty Pittsburgh, the snakes and squirrels in the primitive forests of Michigan and Pennsylvania, seagulls the size of a goose rocking on the glistening waves of Lake Michigan, ships at anchor in the harbor at Buffalo, too many to be counted, each larger, newer, prettier than the one before, the rainbow in the basin of Niagara Falls where the falling water creates a heavy mist-like rain. Rochester, New York, the prettiest city we have seen in America. It had been an amazing year for this young missionary. Before returning to Germany during the summer of 1848, Mother Teresa put Sister Caroline in charge of the schools and business affairs of the school sisters in the United States. Things happened quickly. Caroline opened schools in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Buffalo. More sisters arrived from Munich, and new American members joined them at their center in Baltimore. Everywhere, the children of immigrants needed and welcomed them. At St. Mary's, where we began, the children would rap at our windows and ask, Sisters, when will you come teach us? And in a short time, the children and the sisters became so devoted to each other that neither one wanted to leave the other. Soon, Father Neumann began to send orphans to the sisters. First, two girls, ages five and seven, then a little four-year-old. Before long, they were caring for 16 poor, lonely German orphans. By 1850, just three years after their arrival, the sisters realized that life in a missionary country called for changes in the rules governing their lives. That summer, Sister Caroline was sent to Germany to talk with Mother Teresa about this. Because she arrived unannounced and without any official letter, she was treated with some hesitation by Mother Teresa. Eventually, everything was cleared up, and Mother Teresa sent her back to America with two important documents. The first directed her to go to Milwaukee and set up there the main house of the School Sisters of Notre Dame in North America. The second named her the vicar for Mother Teresa, placing her in charge of all the North American sisters and the schools and orphanages they had begun. There were by now 24 sisters, 17 candidates, 30 orphans, and about 1,250 pupils in seven schools. Sister Caroline was 26 years old. For the next 42 years, from the ever-expanding Milwaukee Mother House, she directed the work of the school sisters. As soon as she arrived in Milwaukee, she began the process of becoming a citizen of the United States. She was here to stay. We Americans, she would write in her letters and reports, this land was her land now, its waterways and railways enabled her to travel wherever Providence called the sisters. Although she continued to make trips to the east to visit and open Notre Dame houses there, the Mississippi River Valley became her home. She opened missions along the Great River from New Orleans to St. Paul, Minnesota, as well as on the Missouri and Ohio rivers and their tributaries. Like the waters of the river, Mother Caroline absorbed whatever she experienced. In 1856, 
writing about her first trip to New Orleans to open a house there. She describes the city's exports and imports, the Spanish moss, the French Quarter, the women's dress. In the market, she found coconuts, pineapple, oranges, citron, and bananas from Cuba, tasty fish, crabs, and oysters, fowl, and animals from southern forests. Everything and every kind of person interested her. Dock workers along the Mississippi, the Negro slaves in the cotton fields, her traveling companions on trains, and the Native American people, whom she met first in 1848 in Michigan and at Niagara Falls. Soon we met two Indian women who were offering their wares for sale, handmade shoes, pouches, purses. We bought a few articles and expressed the wish to see not only the artifacts, but the workers as well. And I took this opportunity to observe them from head to foot. Already at this meeting, Mother Caroline yearned to open a school for Indian children. But her dream came true only in 1886, when she sent sisters to Holy Childhood School in Harbor Springs, Michigan. Mother Caroline opened her heart to all the people of her adopted land, perhaps because she herself was bicultural, having been born in Paris of a French mother and a Bavarian father. In reality, her love was rooted in the gospel. She wrote, I have compassion on the multitude. This expression of pity from the Lord and teacher of all penetrates my whole being. In New Orleans, her sisters taught in German, English, and French. In St. Louis, the Notre Dame sisters staffed the first parochial school for Bohemian children in the United States. At St. Stanislaus in Milwaukee, they began the first school for Polish children, soon followed by others in Chicago. In Quincy, Illinois, she opened the congregation's first school for African-American children. By the mid-1860s, Mother Caroline's sisters were educating and caring for children of immigrants in schools and orphanages from east to west, north to south. Among them were St. Mary's in Buffalo, New York, Holy Redeemer in New York City, St. Joseph in Rochester, New York, St. Vincent Orphanage in Philadelphia, St. James in Baltimore, Visitation in Elm Grove, Wisconsin, St. Stanislaus in Milwaukee, St. George in Kenosha, Wisconsin, St. Mary's in Detroit, St. Michael's in Chicago, St. Mary's in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Blessed Sacrament in Hoka, Minnesota, Saints Peter and Paul in Mankato, Minnesota, St. Mary's in Fort Madison, Iowa, Immaculate Conception in Belleville, Illinois, and St. Alphonsus in New Orleans. Although she also opened institutes of higher learning for young women, Mother Caroline's heart was with the poor. A pastor asked some of her sisters how he could get Mother Caroline to send him school sisters for his parish. Oh, just tell our mother your children are poor and greatly neglected. Then you will most likely succeed. Foundlings arouse the deepest sympathy. And therefore, they also possess our entire love. We received children who were found on the road, in the snow, at street corners, these poor little ones. It makes one's heart so warm, so tender, and at the same time so heavy when children are abandoned by their own parents, even forced upon us. Mother Caroline's compassion and missionary spirit attracted numerous other young women who felt called to the life of Notre Dame. They came from many different cultures and nationalities. Among the earliest postulants in the Milwaukee Mother House were women born in Germany, Scotland, Canada, Belgium, and France. Sister Christina Pothier, a member of the Ottawa Nation, was born in a forest near Chicago. When she died at the early age of 26, Mother Caroline wrote, 
Our tears for her are not yet dried. The children did not want to leave her, always asking to see Sister Christina again. The congregation continued to grow, as each year brought together a new class of enthusiastic novices. Mother Caroline's gifts became legendary. One bishop described her, hers was a magnetic personality. Her dark eyes and stately figure, her powerful voice and confident manner all commanded attention. Always tender of heart, she was also fearless. No matter what happened, she never lost presence of mind. Bishops and priests liked working with her. Eventually, she had sisters in 29 dioceses of the United States and Canada and knew most of the bishops personally. Many became close friends. Rarely did one of them come to Milwaukee without visiting her. Bishop Henny of Milwaukee, who first welcomed her in 1850, continued over the years to be her advisor and friend. Priests, too, became her trusted guides. Father John Neumann, now St. John Neumann of Philadelphia, helped her through those first crucial years in Baltimore. Shortly after her arrival in Milwaukee, Bishop Henny appointed Father Anthony Urbanek as chaplain to the sisters. A gifted teacher and musician, as well as spiritual advisor, he traveled with Mother Caroline on many of her missionary journeys. The next chaplain, Father F. X. Krautbauer, later Bishop of Green Bay, also became a close friend, as did Father Peter Ablin, Mother House chaplain and her biographer. Mother Caroline's heart also reached out to other congregations of women during their pioneer years in America. She often welcomed them as long-term guests and provided educational opportunities for the newcomers. With some, like the Racine Dominicans, Mother Caroline showed her true greatness of soul. When Mother Benedicta Bauer and Sister Thomasina came to Wisconsin to begin their congregation there, Mother Caroline asked her own Notre Dame candidates if anyone would like to join them. One of the two who responded, Mary Oberbrunner, became Mother Hyacintha, General Superior of the Racine community for 35 years. When questioned about this kind of sharing, Mother Caroline would simply say, we are all working for the same God. Skilled at networking and organizing, she was more than an administrator and superior. Like many other immigrant women, she brought with her to North America the gift of beautiful needlework and an appreciation of painting and music. At the Milwaukee Mother House, some sisters taught waxwork, others painting. Mother Caroline herself, accomplished in music, saw to it that sisters and students were also instructed in organ, violin, and piano. In planning large houses, she made sure there were bay windows on the south side so that the sisters could raise plants. She spoke often of valuing both the useful and the beautiful. Like other immigrant women, Mother Caroline was enterprising and independent. When a Wisconsin farmer made advances to her as she was riding in his wagon, she pitched her suitcase out, jumped down. Okay, lady, have it your way then and walk. See if I care what happens to you in this wilderness. Giddy up there. One night in a Chicago hotel, when someone tried three times to force her door open, she wrote her name and residence on a slip of paper and pinned the paper to her habit. If I should be robbed and murdered, I shall at least be identified. Like the river she traveled, Mother Caroline's life had its times of turbulence. Fires, which took the lives of sisters and children. The pain of the Civil War, when the houses in the Confederacy at Richmond and New Orleans were cut off from the rest. The loss of promising young members of the order to yellow fever, typhoid, and tuberculosis. Yet none of these affected Mother Caroline as deeply as the turbulence she experienced on the Mississippi itself. On the morning of June 13, 1858, returning from New Orleans, 
the boiler on the steamer Pennsylvania exploded. Father Urbanek, in the stateroom next to Mother Caroline, was killed. She herself survived, ministering to other victims and finally struggling down a rope into a flatboat where she spent more than six hours in rough waters under the blazing sun. I was spared, reaching land in safety. The rescued passengers numbered about 160, whereas there had been nearly 500 on board. A steamer picked us up, battered in body and soul. I had to return home alone, which I thought at first impossible. But God came to my assistance. I sat down in a corner, giving my tears free reign. It was not long until I was surrounded by a crowd of American ladies who cried with me. That riverboat explosion gave Mother Caroline a profound experience of dependence and care. The American women who cried with her gave her dry clothing and money. A slave girl pressed five dollars into her hand. No, I will not take any money from a slave. I am a slave, but not poor. And you should know that slaves also can do good. Mother Caroline carried that river experience with her through the rest of her life. Her vision became clearer, her trust in God greater. Her prayer life continued to deepen. It embraced the needs of each of her sisters. When someone offered her a prayer book, she replied, Thank you. I need no book. To get through the catalog of all my sisters is prayer book enough for me. I try to recollect which one my mind's eye has not yet seen. Because I must and will place all before my imagination in order, as it were, to tell each one, continue to pray well. To pray well, her deepest yearning, and surely part of the motivation for building the Chapel of Perpetual Adoration in Milwaukee. Here, prayer would continue, night and day, year after year, embracing the needs of the whole world. She was delighted to learn that all the sisters took part in providing the monstrance for the chapel. They adorned it with 50 gems for the 50 years of Mother Caroline's life in SSND. 45 of those years she had spent in America, 42 as mother and leader to the sisters in the United States and Canada. Mother Caroline died on July 22, 1892, just nine days before the dedication of the Chapel of Perpetual Adoration in Milwaukee. Her body was laid out there, and its new bell, called Carolus in her memory, told her passing. On it was inscribed in Latin, Matrem Plango Filias Voco, the mother I mourn, the daughters I call. The indefatigable Mother Caroline, at rest at last. She had established 265 schools and had seen her religious congregation in the United States and Canada grow to nearly 2,000 sisters. From the five pioneer sisters who arrived in New York in 1847, the North American branch of the School Sisters of Notre Dame presently have sisters in provinces in the United States and Canada. They are serving today in various educational capacities and have missionaries in other countries. These sisters in North America continue to minister to the needs of the people in the spirit of Mother Caroline in their concern for the education of children and searching for ways to serve the needs of women. They are committed to education on all levels, from preschool to university, moving to missionary fields in West Africa and East Africa, in Central America and South America, going from the region of Japan to the country of Nepal, from Puerto Rico to the Dominican Republic, 
from the island of Guam to the islands of Ibai and Yap. School Sisters of Notre Dame are also serving with Mother Caroline's missionary spirit among the native peoples in the Southwest and the Northwest Territories and Alaska and many other states. Their means of travel is varied. Traveling by plane, boat, bus, snowmobile, jeep, and even motorbike. They are helping new immigrants, collaborating with pastors and bishops as pastoral associates, superintendents of schools, parish administrators, or even chancellors of dioceses. They collaborate with other committed women and men within the church or ecumenically. They continue to become multicultural in membership. African, Japanese, Guamanian, Puerto Rican, and North American sisters with family names that celebrate the School Sisters of Notre Dame diversity of origin. All of them are proud to proclaim Mother Caroline Fries as theirs, as they reflect together on the words about her in the prologue to their constitution, You Are Sent. Mother Caroline Fries, who through courageous leadership adapted the congregation to life on another continent, perceptively reading the signs of the times, risking innovative response to the needs of the new world. The School Sisters of Notre Dame have changed in appearance considerably since the 19th century. But the spirit that motivates us is still very much the same. The Gospel of Jesus focuses our missionary efforts as we bring the good news wherever we are sent. School Sisters of Notre Dame strive through education to enable people to reach their highest potential in the light of that Gospel. We pray daily that people will receive this good news with an open heart and find joy in their earthly journey. Thank you for watching today's program. Please join us again next week as we share with you more good news in our neighborhood.